We are here today with Gary Horner from Erath Winery. Um, we are in the Austin Reading Room at Nicholson Library. It is August 2nd, 2017, and I'm Stephanie Hoffman. And um, we're going to start off this interview with the question we always ask, which is, why wine? Why wine? You mean, like, why wine for me or just why wine? Um, why <laughs> wine for you? Uh, why wine for me was uh, because it represented a challenge. And my family didn't grow up drinking wine. Uh, and I had a friend in college, his name is Andre. Uh, and Andre, for some reason, thought, you know, normally college beer. You know, no, it's college wine for this guy. He was a wine collector, and he thought I would be interested in um, just trying some wines. And with our background, we were pharmacy majors. The chemistry part of it just fascinated me. Uh, and I didn't know labels or, or anything. And so my friend Andre would start bringing over wines for dinner. Uh, and I would make some really crude college food. <laughs> <laughs> I'm no chef. And uh, one thing led to another, and I just, I just got hooked. You know, he was trying to train me, um, train my palate, I guess. Uh, but what I didn't recognize at the time is he was bringing over, like, benchmark wines of the world. And I didn't know, right? Uh, and then he got to Pinot Noir and explained the whole magic and, and the, the trials and tribulations people go through just to grow it and then make it. I just went, wow, I need to understand that. And then I became just absolutely obsessed. So that's why wine for me. Uh, and, and for me, at that point in my life, everything was black and white, you know. You're, you're a scientist, it's either is or isn't. There's not, none of this gray stuff in between, and, and wine actually is all about the gray stuff in between. And so that's what I've focused on for the last 30 years. And so you said that you were in college to become a pharmacist. Yeah. How did you then go into the wine industry? I, part of my obsession became making wine in my garage. <laughs> And uh, kind of turning my garage into a mini winery. I remember my wife at the time just went, that's nice, sweetheart. And you know, I double insulated the walls and uh, went out and bought winemaking equipment. And here's a significant point in time in my life was uh, I had ridden motorcycles for 16 years and they were big ones. And so I was in love with motorcycles. I sold my motorcycle to buy home winemaking equipment. That's how nuts I was at that time. And then uh, started making uh, wine from grapes. The first grapes I made them from were Cabernet Sauvignon from Washington. I just got the grower's guide uh, sent to me in the mail and I just went down the list calling people. And most of them just said no, because <laughs> you know, I, I only wanted 500 pounds and they're interested in selling tons. Uh, and I finally got to this one guy, who was real friendly, he said, come on over, uh, you can pick them yourself and I'll, I'll loan you containers, and, um, and he did. And that was my first wine, was a Cabernet, uh, which I totally destroyed. <laughs> my first wine was a, a, quite a failure, and when you consider I had access to the hospital laboratory to do all my, task, uh, my testing, and I still blew it, well, there was a lesson there. Uh, <laughs> and I learned from it. And then the following vintage, um, I made Pinot Noir from Oregon and also some Semillon. There used to be Semillon planted down here. Uh, and that's what I did. I just made wine in my garage until I decided pharmacy wasn't for me anymore. <laughs> so after you decided that, um, what was the next step? Uh, the next step was in, in uh, 1987, again, part of my obsession was, was to go and, and to talk with real people. Um, I actually have a doctorate degree in clinical pharmacy, so I, I've had a lot of education, and the last thing I wanted to do, unless I really needed it, was to go to school at Davis. But if I needed it, then I'd do that. And I took a trip in the back of my Mazda B2000, you know, sleeping bag, the whole thing, and headed down the coast. And there were a handful of winemakers um, that I wanted to talk to. I didn't plan my trip out very well, and, and some of these things were just drop-ins. But 
I remember one guy, um, he was the winemaker at Hanzel in the Sonoma area, Bob Sessions was his name, and he was quite a famous individual. I remember calling and he answered the phone and he said, come on over, you know, and so I spent like two hours with this guy just talking. Uh, and then um, Tom Dellinger, another Pinot producer down there, just opened his doors and said, come on in, and let's just talk. And he showed me around his vineyard, and I went, oh, this is, this is the feel I want. And then I had lined up appointments at Davis um, to interview with uh, the head of the department and a couple other professors. So I'm sitting there at this interview. It was Ralph Kunke, and he's passed now. But I can remember sitting in this interview and Ralph saying, we're really interested in you coming to Davis and you know being part of the research program. Yay! <laughs> And I said, but I want to learn how to make wine. And then he looked at me and he said, Gary, anybody can learn how to press the on-off button to a pump. <laughs> and he was serious. And it was then, I just figured, well, this is not the place for me. They do fabulous research. We owe them a great debt, uh, but that's not what I needed. So I'm a little depressed. I get back in my car and I head up the coast. And on the way back, <clears throat> Uh, I'm driving up, and I knew I knew of Barney Watson, and Barney used to be uh, the state enologist, and I'd listened to him speak on many occasions, and I thought, well, what the heck? His winery, Taiyi, is not too far off of I-5, and I'm not kidding, no phone calls, nothing. So I just kind of find my way, you know, no GPS either, and so I find my way over to Barney's place, and sure enough, I pull up, and there's this big barn, and the doors open and I see him in there and he's topping barrels and took the time to talk to me. This, this is neat. I like this feel. He said, oh, by the way, if you're heading north, I suggest you stop in and talk to Terry Castile at Bethel Heights. So it's like a Saturday or a Sunday, I think. And I take a chance, right? What are the odds? I pull up. And I never uh, met Terry, but I walked into the tasting room, and there he was. This is a little beanie cap on and stuff, and he's counting out the cash drawer for the day. Mm -hmm. And I explained my story to him. You know, oh, I'm from Seattle. I want to get involved with the industry and and all that kind of stuff. And and he said, Well, Gary, we don't have anything right now, but make a point of checking in someday. And he told me later. <laughs> He thought I was just another one of those Seattle grape nuts, <laughs> and I never see me again. Uh, he saw me again, and I literally—I uh, don't know how many months after that it was, probably three or four—made the decision to sell our house. We didn't have kids at the time, so sell our house uh, and move to Salem, and I would continue to practice pharmacy just to get into the area to get my foot in the door. Okay, so this is what happens. We move down here, move into an apartment. I go to work at this place for three days, this hospital pharmacy, and they hired me for kind of a high level position. And I just went, I can't do this. I'm sorry, but I can't do this. And I literally walked away from that job and went to Bethel Heights and pleaded. <laughs> Uh, and Terry had a spot on the bottling line for $6 an hour. I'm like, great. And my wife was employed, you know, and we were pretty talented at, you know, having been through college days to, to live on very little. <laughs> and we did that for quite a while. So long story short, I was at Bethel Heights for four years. Um, and they were the people that did all the gave me all the gray matter, if you will, or a start on understanding what's in between black and white. And um, they were so phenomenally patient with me because <laughs> I was just all excited, you know, and thought I had the answers to everything. And, and he'd put my arm, Terry put my, his arm around me and go, now, Gare, let's just go and take a look at this over here. And that's a nice thought and everything. And, you know, I mean, it was just great. <laughs> They were so patient, and they, um, Terry exposed me to his winemaking philosophy and in the winery, and then his brother Ted, because there wasn't a whole lot of work. I mean, you bottled, you did harvest, 
and then it was, well, you're done. I don't want to be done. <laughs> well, then we'll put you to work in the vineyard. Pruning, great. And so that's what I do. And so uh, Terry's brother, Ted, started introducing me to, to vineyard stuff. And I became just nuts about that too. You know, I, I got everything I could get my hands on to read. Uh, and then have Ted and Terry as my mentor was crazy cool. And then uh, I said, well, I'd kind of like to take a shot at making my own wine. I went, well, that's great. You can use all of our equipment. And in fact, you can, when you go out and sell our wine, go out and make sales calls, you can take your wine along with and, and sell it too. And you can pour your wine in our tasting room. Up in the, and it was just like, wow, this is like dream come true. And that happened. So I had my own labels called Destiny Vintners for a couple of years until I had kids and it became obvious I needed to make a choice. And my choice was kids and not to beat myself against the wall trying to start a new brand and also work at a winery. Um, but those guys, and I was there for four years, gave me that experience that you can't get in a book. Uh, and so my start was the luckiest start in the universe. And I think if I didn't have that start, I'm not sure I'd be sitting here today. Yeah. Um, can you talk about um, the time in between Bethel Heights and going to Erath Winery? Um, what, was, what would happen there? What was that journey? I, after, after four years, um, Terry said, Carrie, I kind of don't have a lot to teach anymore, so maybe you should consider moving on. I mean, he wasn't firing me or anything like that. He was just encouraging me to, to leave the nest. And right about that time, uh, David Autry, you probably know from Westry, David was going to do an internship down at Flynn um, for that vintage, 92. And David called me up and go, hey, you want to swap? You know, you want to do this one? If I can come up and do the one at Bethel Heights, I went, sure, that's great. So I got to work with Rich Cushman um, down at Flynn for a vintage, which was great. Uh, and then right about that time, um, there were some rumors that there might be a position available uh, at a nearby winery. And that's all they would say is a nearby winery. And, and as it turns out, that nearby winery was Witness Tree. And so I interviewed for that position and got that. And that involved uh, not only making the wine, but managing the vineyard, which, okay, that fine, I could do that, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yay. Uh, and then my anxiety about managing the vineyard was uh, put to bed a little bit by, I worked out a deal with Ted Castile. I said, Ted, I wanna bounce everything off of you if you don't mind. And he was nice enough to let me do that. So. For three years, um, I was a winemaker and vineyard manager for Witness Tree, and both of my kids were born during that, that tenure. My daughter was born between Pinot Noir and Chardonnay by design because we were harvesting Pinot Noir and we kind of looked at kind of the baby schedule thing, and Chardonnay there was oftentimes maybe a week later than Pinot, and we went, okay, we agreed to have an induction, <laughs> which we did, and brought my daughter Lauren home, and then I went right back to work doing Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. So she's the between Pinot and Chardonnay baby. <laughs> so, uh, so that was Witness Tree, and then I had a sense that I needed to accumulate some larger winery experience, and at that point in time, that to me, California was not, I didn't want to do that didn't want to do California, uh, Washington State offered some opportunities and there was a job that opened up as associate winemaker for Washington Hills. Uh, and I was working under Brian Carter, who's one of the pioneers up there. Uh, so I did that for three years, but I didn't leave Pinot Noir behind. So what we did, uh, at my suggestion, they had this uh, top tier label at Washington Hills, it was called Apex. And I think it's, they still do. And I said, hey Brian, how about we make a Pinot Noir from Oregon under the Apex 
thing. And Brian loved Pinot Noir. He says, well, great, you find the fruit, we'll do it. And uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, locate five tons of Pinot Noir at the old O'Connor Vineyard, which is now Zenith. And Pat O'Connor, uh, my wife and I actually lived at O'Connor for a brief period of time. So right after Joe Dobbs moved out, we moved in. Uh, and so the deal was, I called up Terry Castillo and said, Terry, will you keep an eye on this block for me and give me the cue when it's ready to go? I'll show up in a U-Haul. <laughs> and that's exactly what would happen. And uh, so I did that for three years. Just got the call from Terry and just motored on down. Pat would pick it, you know, load it in the bins, and I'd mosey on up back up to Washington and get up there and do five tons of Oregon Pinot in Washington. So I didn't. I kept my finger in it, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, so the large winery stuff, what didn't turn out to be magic. I mean, it's it, you. You learn techniques and you learn, you know, some scale stuff, and that's great. You know how to how to make a larger lot of something. And um, I also functioned as their vineyard liaison up there. I interacted and gave instructions to all their growers. It, and so I was just accumulating all these really great experiences, but I really missed Oregon. Uh, and then the next step <clears throat> involved um, Steve Girard at Benton Lane, uh, was building a new winery, uh, and the guy that was managing his vineyard, Sean McRitchie, uh, son of Bob McRitchie, said, hey, you know, yeah, think about Gary Horner. Uh, great. So we made contact, and I remember uh, flying down to California to the old Girard Winery to meet Steve. I never met him before, and that was quite an experience. Uh, fl flew me down there and just ran me around and, and showed me stuff and interviewed me with the most crazy interview question. I don't think he'll mind me repeating that. Do you want, I'll, I can repeat that. Yeah. You can edit it if you want. <laughs> So I'm sitting there, and he says, okay, Gary, here's the situation. You're looking for a house to buy, right? You're driving down the road, off on the right-hand side, there's this old man, and he's got a for sale sign, and he's just slowly hammering it into the ground, and it has the sales price, and it says $80,000. And you know, looking at that house, that's a $160,000 house. What are you going to do? I went, well, I offer him $80,000 and, and close the deal. He said, wrong answer. I went, okay. He said, offer him 70. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, he hired me, uh, even though I answered the question inappropriately to him. And uh, so I was the winemaker that opened up. The, the winery was designed, but I equipped it and then ran it for the first five years, uh, which was really kind of a neat experience. Uh, they've got a great vineyard site down there, but and it's in Monroe. It's down by Eugene, and all my buddies are up north. I kind of miss that. And I'm a kind of a techno geeky kind of person, and so is Dick Ebrath. And I was doing some stuff down at Benton Lane that was not traditional winemaking. It was kind of exploratory stuff. And Dick got wind of it. Uh, and I had also had an interest in moving up north. And a couple of times we tried to connect. Uh, either he didn't have a position ready or I had a great thing going at Benton Lane, and I wasn't quite ready. But finally, uh, he came down with his general manager at the time, Steve Volstek. And Steve's family, like, goes way back. And um, so he came with Steve, and I remember Dick had, I think, just had hip surgery or something, so he was kind of gimping around a little bit. And I walked him, those guys through the winery, and they said, you know, we'd like you to come up and take a look, take a look at Erath because we're interested. And I did, you know, one of those under the cover of darkness after hours, they showed me around and it was pretty grim. 
And what I mean by grim is um, they were making an awful lot of wine in a really small facility, which that small facility made sense in the beginning. And I think Dick had no idea it was going to grow and be so successful. So there were some constraints there that I recognized. And then went up to his house and had an interview at his house. His house is at the top of a hill and it looks across the Willamette Valley and you're sitting there and with a glass of wine and Dick Erath is across the table from you. I'm just going, how did this happen? <laughs> you know, really, and, and I hadn't been kind of involved with the business that long, I didn't think. Uh, and then he made me the proverbial offer I couldn't refuse. And that was in um, July of 2003. That's right. Yeah. So I had finished making the 2002s at Benton Lane and then uh, moved up to Sherwood. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. Dick had a, had a, uh, you know, I respected him a lot, but he, he sort of had a reputation of maybe being a micromanager a bit or uh, maybe a little gruff at times, and and I had heard that. And Steve Volstek uh, was really, really helpful for for me to get up to speed with with Dick's personality and, and the deal. And he's just such a remarkable and great human being. I love him dearly. Uh, but uh, Steve helped me kind of navigate the early days and part of the navigation was in our deal dick in my deal was that okay i'll come and make wine but you need to back away from it and let go of it because prior to that time he had always been a co-winemaker with whomever was there and he agreed to do it uh, and he opened his checkbook too to make several improvements that we needed to do in order to improve the quality of the wine, which had always been good, but the need was to take it higher. Um, but more importantly, perhaps, or e of equal importance, was to grow the volume to make it an attractive acquisition, because Dick was looking for an exit strategy, uh, but he was totally supportive of that. Uh, and it, so it was a marvelous three years that I had with Dick until he sold uh, the business to St. Michelle Wine Estates. Which when, when that happens, and I, I knew I was entertaining other people from California wineries to look at it, and I'm thinking, oh my God, what's gonna happen here? Or all of a sudden, somebody from California gonna buy us and get us, and I'm looking for work with two kids. And uh, exactly the opposite happened. It, Dick came and he, came to me one night and said that, hey, um, I think I'm going to take the St. Michelle offer, which was a relief for me because the three years I spent in Washington, I had met a lot of those folks, you know, in key positions, and they had this really great reputation, and certainly with their growers uh, and also within the wine groups. So that eased my anxiety a little bit, but still you never know what's going to happen and then and then i had the sit down meeting with ted basler this is before things closed and and he says hey gary you know we're buying erath because well hey we don't have an oregon brand and we would like that in our por portfolio and it's like the most successful brand out there so ted's question to me was how can i help you make it better you know, and you could like hear the proverbial pin drop. <laughs> I go, I'm thinking, is this guy for real? And I'd always wanted to make more improvements at ERath, and I would have, I'm sure, had Dick stayed, but I had a short list, and I've never been a person that is extravagant, you know? I, I want to be practical. And uh, so I put out this modest list to Ted, so oh, there's these few things here. And he said, Gary, I don't think you understand what I'm saying. He said, if you wanted to be prepared for every type of vintage you can think of, and we all know we're sitting in a kind of a marginal climate at times, what would that list look like? And, and I have nothing to lose, right? 
you know, be honest. And I said, well, blah. <laughs> you know, here's this enormous, this concept in this list of stuff, and it's going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this. And I went, okay, that's what I wanted to hear, what you honestly felt. And within three years, 100% of those improvements were there. No questions asked. Now, clearly, when you uh, want something, you need to justify it by the improvement in quality, and which we did. You know, so there's an expectation that you actually live up to what you, you said you're going to do, and we did do that. But and, and nobody within that really large company tells me how to make wine. It's like amazing. You know, Dick didn't tell me how to make stuff. He would stop by, you know, and be real curious, and you know, I'd show him what's going on. Uh, but uh, same thing with St. Michelle. I have somebody I report to, and he'll come down every once in a while. He'll show me what's going on. But nobody tells me how to make wine, and I have the final say about what goes in a bottle and how much goes in a bottle. Say we have a challenging vintage, like 11 uh, or 13. I uh, had to make some really difficult decisions out in the vineyards, and our volume was way, way down. And there were a few single vineyards that, you know, we make up to 10 or 12 that just didn't make the quality cut. So I don't do it. Now, not everybody's happy about that, because you've got a marketing department that kind of thinks that, well, it'd be really nice if we had so many cases of Prince Hill and so many cases of that. I went, very nice. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, since they purchased the place in 2006, gosh, it's been it's been over 10 years now. It's been like a dream come true for a winemaker to to have access to stuff, capital. But then the really cool part of it is there's a group of winemakers within this large Saint Michel group that we're all really good buddies. And so you have somebody, if you have a problem, you can connect with them and talk things through or get together and commiserate, whatever it is. Uh, so it's been pretty neat. I've been really, really, really fortunate. Um, what is it like um, having that final decision and say as a winemaker in one of the founding wineries in Oregon? I, it's a lot easier now than it was for me initially when I was starting to make those decisions. You know, I had that same call down at uh, Benton Lane. You know, I'd share stuff obviously with Steve and you get a read from, was it, am I pleasing you? Am I not pleasing you? Am I making a huge mistake here? Steve was brilliant uh, and is. Uh, and then the first time you're doing something like that, you're kind of sweating bullets. You know, winemaking for me is like a Rolodex of experiences in your head. And if you're paying attention along the way, uh, the writing on those little Rolodex cards is clear. <laughs> if you aren't paying attention, you go, oh, that's right. I had that happen before. What was that? And you can't remember. So. You just have to access what you feel is your gut, and your gut is those experiences, and trust yourself, and don't look back. And that's a bit nerve-wracking the first time you sit down and do this, and when the acquisition, when St. Michelle purchased Erath, before that, uh, we would only make a couple of single vineyards, you know, Prince Hill, maybe Leland, uh, and then this um, thing called a state selection, and then Oregon Pinot Noir. And so, but what was actually happening behind the scene, there were all these individual single vineyards, great sites that Dick had cultivated over the years that I would end up having to just blend away because we just wanted Prince Hill and Leland and maybe one other. So. St. Michelle buys in 2006, so I still have the 2005 wines in barrel. So all these single <laughs> vineyards are still in barrel. And I can remember the marketing manager uh, came to me and said, so Gary, what are you bottling this year? And I must admit I took advantage of that situation. <laughs> 
and said the following 10 items. And so that's how that whole broad line of single vineyards actually started at Erath. It, it had started, it was going on for years, but all those wines were being blended out because the desire was just to make two. And I said, well, here's 10. And they went, yay. And so now those wines um, really do a lot to support our wine club and retail. And it's a study, it's a study of individual spots on the planet when I make those wines, I don't. I use the same winemaking technique across all of them, and I think we all know that you could, you could vary your winemaking technique and radically change wine style. I don't think that's fair. Uh, so when people are tasting our single vineyards, you know that I did the same thing, and that's a snapshot of that spot and that planet from my interpretation. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a ramble. <laughs> Um, what would you say your winemaking philosophy is? Uh, to make wines that I like. That's, uh, I don't think I could tolerate making wines that I didn't care for. And so I love Pinot Noir, but my, I guess if you wanted to talk about a style, I'm kind of a light-handed winemaker, and I think most people would agree with that. Uh, and so I don't do a whole lot to try to extract a lot of things from Pinot. It just, I just sort of let it, let it be. And it tends to be that those wines come out by design, um, a little more on the elegant side, softer, maybe rounder, uh, maybe not as dark in color. Uh, at, at least the wines that I had in my head from when I was living in Seattle, were Pinot Noirs from the late 70s and early 80s. Mm -hmm. And those are wines like um, Irie and Sokoblosser, um, and there were a few others. And the Irie, I remember the, the transparent, just really, really light, beautiful Pinot. And to me, that's how it should be. And so that's, I guess you could say, I'm trying to replicate that. That's just what I like, and that's what I continue to do. And did anyone or anything influence that philosophy? Uh, Besides those wines? Have, having those wines, you know, and I have to give a great deal of credit to my friend Andre uh, when he introduced me to Pinot. It was after some really pretty big wines, you know, California cabs, early California cabs, Bordeaux's and that type of thing. He waited to the very end to introduce Pinot. And that was an exercise in becoming, and this is going to sound really weird, but um, quiet in your mind to appreciate it. So all these other wines were just like, bam, in your face. And, and they were very complex, but they really were pretty heavy hitters. And, and you didn't have to, to work too hard to get something out of the experience. You weren't, I knew I wasn't getting everything out of the experience, but it was certainly something I had to work at it. And then he got to this Pinot, and I was born in 1954, and I remember this Pinot, uh, it's a red burgundy, was from 53. And I don't remember the producer or anything like that, uh, but Andre, he says, this is a bottle that was out of some dead doctor's cellar in Germany, and I thought, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get something like that? Uh, and there was this great, you know, presentation. Andre was like that. It's part French, uh, and where he gets ready to open the bottle, and he stops and he says, "This wine, when I pour the first sample, is going to live in the bottle for maybe 20 or 30 minutes, and then it will be dead." I went, what? <laughs> What does that mean? And, and so this is how it unfolds. He pulls the enormously long cork out of it and just pours that first glass or sample. And I look at it and I think he's pulling my leg because this was just like brown. It looked like badly oxidized Chardonnay. It just looked like bad. And I look up at him and he goes, well, I take it take a sip and it just exploded with sweetness softness it was like this 
big embrace. Um, it still had f essences of, of like violets and forest floor and mushrooms. And all this stuff was in the nose. It was just like, how can something that looks like that <laughs> taste like this? And darn, if he wasn't right, in about a half hour, 40 minutes, that just totally tightened up and turned into this thin, acidic yuck. I went, that's magic. But that initial wine, that wine was soft and round and embracing and was every bit as impactful as some of these enormous first growth Bordeaux that he had been showing me months before. And that's what uh, rang my bell about Pinot, was that softness can be so powerful and complex. But to really appreciate it, uh, I spoke of having to kind of clear your mind and not try so hard. I was guilty of trying too hard you know, on a lot of things, you know. And if you just sort of relax into it a little bit, things come to you, you know. You gotta be patient. That's what Terry told me. You gotta be patient, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> and he was right. And uh, but that to this day is how I operate when I spend a lot of time in our cellar tasting through individual lots, individual barrels within lots, making notes on everything. And when I do it, I want it, well, it's never as quiet as it is in here, but it's pretty close after hours. Uh, and you kind of get in this groove, and it's sort of zenish where you just fall into this groove and you're tasting and waiting. Okay. Just making your notes and just waiting. So wait for at least a minute. And sometimes to help me with being disciplined, I'll actually use a small timer. <laughs> so every, every wine gets the same shot at it. And, uh, but it is, it's, you're, you're just waiting and listening. Uh, sometimes I do that process at home where I'll bring you know, certain lots home so I can study them at home in a quiet environment. Uh, and so for me, it's all about being quiet, I guess. It's kind of how Pino is, or should be, I think. That's me. Mm. But. And then you've kind of mentioned this a little bit, um, but the role of technology in your winemaking, how does that um, pair with your winemaking philosophy and how do you use technology that might be in a way that's different than maybe other winemakers? Oh yeah, that's, that's a good question. The, <clears throat> the, the, the model had always been, you know, you studied tradition and it went, yay, you know. But wait, there's more. Uh, there were the, the original breakthrough, at least for me, in technology that I could apply to <clears throat> the large volume of Pinot Noir that we produce that basically gets our name out there, keeps the doors open, and attracts more people to Pinot. That original technique, uh, it's called micro-oxygenation. And of course, I mean, remember that I'm like reading everything, you know, I can get my hands on. And so I start reading about this development uh, in the south of France. And the chemistry of oxygen and tannins has been known since the 40s. So it's like not magic. People know how to do it. That's what happens when you're aging wine in barrel. There's a slow in ingress of oxygen and certain chemical reactions that take place. Well, some guy, some professor in south of France figured out how to deliver these really minute amounts of oxygen um, through a special type of meter device directly into the wine in a big tank. And I read about that and I went, well, it's really interesting. Um, why is nobody doing that in Pinot, I thought, and nobody was. Uh, that technique had jumped the Atlantic and was being used for Merlot in California by a certain producer and so you know I was really keenly studying this and began became the first person to use it on Pinot 
when I was at Benton Lane, and I did it on trial basis, and I had a consultant. He consulted for, for wine, and this guy's like famous. Uh, his name's Jeff McCord, and he's out of California, and he was the person that first developed the apparatus to be able to do this type of thing. And so Jeff uh, loaned me his original box, you know, there have been multiple improvements on it, but he said, I'll let you, I'll loan it to you, you can call me anytime, help you out. Which I did, <laughs> like, a lot. Because <laughs> uh, Pinot Noir is the structure of the tannins, um, it's really very delicate. And if you overdo it with oxygen, you turn it into a brown, dead wine, kind of like that burgundy I was telling you about that totally dried up. Well, you can do that in a tank and there's no going back. Mm -hmm. And so I did some controlled uh, um, experiments at Benton Lane doing this and, and honed it down. And that's huge. And I'll tell you what the huge part of this is. First of all, it's more precise than a barrel. And let's just say you had a 6,000 gallon tank. That's 100 barrels worth. Say you had that wine all spread out 100 barrels. You went and you tasted each one of those 100 barrels. They're all going to be anywhere from slightly different to really, really different in terms of the porosity of the wood and the rate in which they let oxygen in. Not to mention the flavor and aroma compounds of the wood themselves, but the whole oxygen transfer can be radically different. So envision that 100 barrels in a tank, that's one thing. I can deliver oxygen to one item, not a hundred. And that one item, I know exactly where it is at all points in time. So I can be much more precise in how I can structure these wines. And for that lower tier Oregon Pinot Noir, it's vital that that be a soft and approachable wine with no rough edges. I mean, it's absolutely vital. And so this was a way to eliminate barrels and grow the program uh, and have better control over wine production. So that was just one. And uh, we continue to do that today. And there have been many others that have adopted that technique that have come to me and like, I'll, I'll, I'll give people pointers. That's the other thing I love about this industry is people call you up or you can call anybody up and ask any question you want. You know, I'm not going to give away all the secrets, but I'm uh, certainly willing to help you so you don't make mistakes. Um, so that was one, the micro-oxygenation. Uh, and then the other one was the way in which we managed the fermentation cap. I mean, traditionally, that was a, you did that by punching down, or you did that by pumping over. And uh, this one technique was developed in California called pulse air. And it was originally developed to mix really thick fluids like sludge <laughs> and even Hershey's chocolate and tankers, you know, <laughs> seriously, and paint and stuff. And what it was, was a, a device that would inject just instantaneously a ball of like air or inert gas, whatever it is. And so when it does that, that will float to the surface and create a current. You know, brilliant. It's a small thing, and it really revolutionized how people mixed stuff like that. Uh, and then some smart person thought, well, wait a minute. We could maybe try that on mixing uh, wine tanks. Boom, brilliant. We can mix wine tanks. Hey, well, let's try it on a fermenting tank and developed a way in which you could do it and break up the cap in an incredibly gentle way. Now, when you think about punching down and you're just like leaning on that punch down stick and it's got a disc on the end of it. You're putting a lot of energy onto that cap to break it. And the disc is literally as it's going through the cap is, is shredding the berries and expose, exposing the seeds, which you know are kind of your enemy in Pinot Noir, they're quite bitter. Uh, and you're dropping a lot of seeds out. Uh, Let's say you're instead pumping over. And sometimes when you pump over, 
you're pumping over a big tank and you have to have the pump going pretty darn fast to create a fire hose or at least a stream that can reach eight feet across to the other side that has a lot of force okay? when it hits the cap it's kind of doing the same thing it's smashing berries and dropping seeds the beauty of pulse air is this boom this this ball that instantly gets injected is like pushing up a column of wine into the cap so that volume occurs it pushes up before the bubble even gets there through hydraulic effect and so that literally when you're doing this on the first tank you do it on you think you're going to end up wearing it and you can actually see the entire cap rise up so it goes boom boom rises up and then finally it starts to crack a little bit and then it just breaks in and you're done and you haven't had any physical impact on it and so you can actually measure the gentleness through looking at the tannin extraction and the seed extraction and using this technique is perfect for the style of wine that I like um, that softer style and I don't want any bitterness in it and it helps keep the seeds and the berries so those are two of the really principal ones that have radically changed how we make wine at Erath and also across the world that's a brilliant technique both of them yeah um, and then going a little bit more um, broader in your experience in the wine industry um, what organizations are you a part of Well, I'm part, part of, uh, just to get the journal, the American Society of Enology and Vit Viticulture. <laughs> well, I like the journal. Uh, and then um, I'm active in Salud, uh, for sure. ERETH has always been, uh, but I'm on the steering committee. Uh, so is my wife. Uh, so that, and um, on the research board for the Oregon Wine um, Research Board, uh, to review studies and that type of stuff. And then active in, uh, you know, we have technical sessions where winemakers get together and talk about uh, plans for trials. Really interesting one happened in 2013, and I, I think really illustrates some of the spirit of Oregon is, uh, actually this was 2011. 2011 was a really, really, really late year. It was the latest year we ever had, and seriously, there's a group of us thinking, this is so rough that we may not make red wine this year. It's that bad, that late. You know, we were looking at, you know, harvest dates that potentially would be in November. And by that time, you're really well entrenched into the fall rains. Uh, and so a meeting was called to get together the folks that have had this experience before, myself included, uh, to get together with anybody else that wanted to come and talk about what do you do when the, you know, the proverbial stuff hits the fan, you know, uh, what are you gonna do? Well, here we can share um, that kind of stuff. So being part of technical groups, I think, is really important. I'm sure I'm leaving something out. <laughs> and then you've kind of talked about your experience. You've talked about your experience um, since you started in the industry to now. How has it changed, um, either you can talk either how has the wine changed or the um, organizations or the interactions you've had? How have those, how has it changed since you started um, back then? Um, my wine style hasn't changed. I think it's refined to the point where I'm really confident in what I'm doing and, and have have that sense where that wasn't always the case. I mean, I was confident, you know, and you had to make decisions and you did that and you kind of maybe doubted yourself a little bit. Well, those, those days are behind me and I don't want to sound cocky, but it's really a good feeling to know that you've been through enough stuff that you feel prepared for almost any situation and to make the most out of any situation or at least know how to access resources to do that. So that's a really good feeling that I didn't have for a while. <laughs> uh, and, and then, what was the rest of the part of the question? It was? Um, yeah, just um, how the industry has changed. Oh, okay. Well, it's obviously uh, gotten really big. When I first uh, started at ERATH in 2003, I was bottling the 2002s for Dick. 
And that total amounted to maybe 30,000 cases. And that included everything, Pinot Noir, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc. Uh, and, and I think without divulging too much information and getting whacked for it, which <laughs> they, nobody would, we shipped well over 200,000 cases last year. You know, and the, uh, on the high side of two hundred, way in the high side of two hundred thousand cases. So, when I never thought I'd be making that much wine, when I came to Oregon, I thought, well, it'll be the little tiny wine property, and you know, then my kids will inherit it. My kids have no interest in it, but uh, to have grown to that level, as have others in the industry, and more people are coming in, um, the size of it, just in people count, has really grown. Um, kind of, kind of to the well. It, it's at the level where you can't know everybody, and there's so many people I don't know. And I go to functions, and I feel like a real old guy, but I'm not. I'm not. But I look around, and it's like I know three people in the room, and they're my age, and the rest of them are young. And you know, where are they coming from? They're young, they're talented. It's great. It's the next generation, as as it should be, but kind of feeling like you're becoming in the minority uh, is kind of an odd feeling. But, but it's good at the same time. You know, I think our area has been endorsed internationally, nationally. Certainly when, when St. Michelle bought in down here, that was a big statement. Uh, when Domaine Duran endorsed, when they bought in, boom. The other French people are coming in, yay. Uh, Jackson family, same thing. There's a momentum that is, you can feel it. And I've been able to feel it for maybe the last 10 years of that, okay, yeah, we are we are well seated on the international stage. Can we grow to be able to supply what the perceived demand is? That's the challenge, you know, can we grow enough fruit? And I think the answer to that question is, uh, there are there's a lot of acreage left to plant. Um, so just getting a handle on what the potential market is, and I hate to talk like a marketing person, but it's reality, you can make the best wine in the world, and if you can't sell it, you got a problem. Um, there's a great deal of room to grow. And, and to, to even to wrap your head around that, that's what I constantly think about. Okay, so if we're this big now, what if somebody comes along and says, we wanna be this big? I know exactly what to do. And it's like just thinking those things. Mm -hmm. Or, okay, wait a minute, I gotta get back to this two barrel lot and focus on that. You know, it's gonna be our salute wine, you know. So I get to do both of those things. And I, I have the staff that have expertise in those things individually. So it, to, to be able to say that you can, you actually can do it all as a large winery if you give it all the same attention, that everything is the most important thing, you can do that. And there have been a number of occasions where um, we're overlooked because we are large. Oh, that's ERAT, they're, they're, they're big. You know, they don't need to be into this event. Or, oh, they're A to Z, they're, they're big, they don't, who cares, right? Well, hey, there's a group of people on the other side of that that care an awful lot and can do every bit as fine of a job as a small winery. And so I think there's a little prejudice there. <laughs> um, so what's in the future for UAth Winery? World dominance. <laughs> <laughs> well, growth is, for sure. Uh, the um, growth of the Oregon Tier Pinot Noir uh, we're nowhere close to filling what we see as potential out there. And there's a lot of people that are going after that pie, and that's what keeps the doors open for us to do all these other specialty things. Uh, we bought a couple of vineyards, which I'm really excited about. One is down in Amity. It's called Willakaya Vineyard. And it's uh, interesting in that it's quite a mix of soils. It's, it's got both volcanic and marine sediment and literally faces the Van Duzer Corridor. So it's a, a great site in a hot vintage because it keeps nice and cool. And the soils tend to be relatively shallow. So the clusters that you get out there are smaller 
and the berries are smaller, so the wines tend to be uh, more intense and very mineral driven. Chardonnay and Pinot Noir both. Uh, and then we also purchased Knight's Gambit uh, up in the Dundee Hills. And Knight's Gambit goes back, I think, to 1988 or 86, something like that. So it's a pretty old site that Dick uh, helped develop on various phases of it. And I'd been working with it ever since I got to ERAP. Well, the folks that owned it are getting a little on in years. And, Owning a vineyard is not exactly the most fun thing in the world. Uh, and they decided to get out, and it was just a perfect moment for us to buy it. And what we're going to do there is we'll be moving the old ERAF facility that we underline old, goes back to 1970, <laughs> as rustic elegance, as we like to say, uh, to a brand new facility on Knight's Gambit. And, but it's, it's not going to be to make the big volume wine. It's only going to be for the small uh, single vineyards and estate selection. But it's going to be an incredible experience. And I'm designing the winery right now. We have another group that's designing the retail experience and VIP experience. It's going to be drop dead gorgeous. So that's a couple of years down the road, 2019. So it's for me, it's like, wow, this is really neat because for the first time I've been able to actually design something instead of having to live with other people's ideas, <laughs> which are not necessarily bad, but uh, to not have to walk around a winery with a roll of duct tape and a monkey wrench in your pocket, it will be nice. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, we've talked about this a little bit, but what do you think is in the future for the Oregon wine industry? Well, uh, growth for sure and I can say that we're gonna have to in order to do that uh, if we we're just talking about Pinot Noir high tier Pinot Noir is one thing I mean that's gonna be pretty much confined to the north end of the valley I know some of my friends in the south end of the valley if they see this will shoot me mm -hmm. uh, but the preponderance of the high tier will remain up here but when you're looking at trying to expand the broader base we're going to have to move out of the Willamette Valley if we're just talking about one variety, and that's Pinot. So uh, we're active right now in exploring areas in southern Oregon, where it's going to be 115 today. <laughs> what are we thinking? Uh, we're uh, putting in Pinot Noir vineyards that are at higher elevations. So right now, um, land is less expensive down there, except for the, the cannabis growers are driving up land prices. Uh, and the whole strategy there is to move Pinot Noir into an environment that might come in maybe 10 days before the Willamette Valley. So if you're dealing with one variety and it all ripens at once, it is just, uh, you don't want to be there. <laughs> uh, but if we can stagger ripeness, and we've been working with a couple of vineyards down there that I think there's an awful lot of potential. So I expect that Southern Oregon is going to see some growth. Uh, and I don't want to speak to any other varieties other than Pinot. Chardonnay, really excited about. Uh, the Chardonnays that I worked with uh, when I got here in 1988 uh, were some of the older clone selections, which in cooler climate, real cool years, um, were a challenge. And when the newer Dijon clones of Pinot Noir came in, so came newer Dijon clones of Chardonnay. And, and I think we've gotten to the point where we really understand it and there is demand out in the marketplace. When I go into the market, people say, you have an Oregon Chardonnay? And I say, man, you know, like 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. Where's your Pinot Gris, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but the Chardonnay momentum is, is starting to roll, snowball is starting to grow, and it has that same feeling like when Pinot started to get traction. And that, it's, this is the time, and this is critical. This is the time where you don't want to make a mistake. You never want to make a mistake, but don't make a mistake just when you're starting to get some traction. So there's an awful lot of effort and a lot of credit I have to give to Dave Adelsheim. He's such a visionary. Um, recognized, he recognized that, okay, Chardonnay's taken off and somebody could really screw it up and would look bad for all of us. Uh, organized a, a technical group for everybody to get together and show Chardonnay and talk about issues, and just like they had done with Pinot Noir years ago. Uh, and it's funny, it's that, that same core group of individuals who had the vision, but I think maybe more importantly than just having the vision, 
they shared with each other what didn't work so the other one wouldn't make that mistake. I mean, they shared what, what did work, but they shared what didn't work too. And I don't think if it wasn't for that, that we would be where we are today because there are so many places to go wrong in this. <laughs> uh, yeah. And then what advice do you have for someone who wants to become a winemaker in Oregon? Well, that's a really good question. My path was not the traditional path, but I'm really happy it worked out that way. Um, because I think I would have, if I would have plugged into Davis, I would have done that and not ended up here maybe. And that's was, was kind of weird to think, but I would not have gotten the tools that I needed. I would have had to launch off from there and then nobody would have hired me up here because I would have been to school and it had been too expensive and I would have ended up in California as an enologist or something. Or who knows, I could have been a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> could have happened. Um, I would say to, to plug in at a ground level uh, a ground level being like an intern. I don't, I'm not talking volunteering, don't do that. Uh, but get in at a level where you're going to have direct interaction with the decision maker. And it's really hard, I think, to you know, sit down for an interview if you want to be an intern, because you want to be an intern, you're really excited. But I think it's really important to know who you're going to be with, you know, who the owners are, because that's your start. You know, I just got so phenomenally lucky with the folks at Bethel Heights. Um, and you can find experiences out there, but it's almost like you've got to interview who you're going to be with. But get in with something where you are, you are hands on with everything. Uh, if that's what you want to end up being. Now, if you just want to be, really, I want to be a winemaker and I will hire somebody to actually do it. Well, you can do that too. Uh, but for me, the most satisfying part of it, and I miss it a lot, is um, this hand, the hands-on being out, you know, sampling in the vineyard, bringing things into the winery, hooking up equipment, and just, you know, getting sweaty and bloody and everything. I just love doing that. Every piece of equipment in a winery I, I can use, and I have taught people how to use. And that is really neat for me. But I do miss the, you know, hooking things up and watching stuff happen. And uh, because we've grown so large, it's just not a good use of my time. But if somebody can plug in at that level and have somebody who's really interested in teaching, and I'm, I'm interested in, in teaching because if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be where I'm at. You know, and I think it's just an obligation. But if people can find that, connect with that, and then, Word of mouth gets out, you know, say hey, so-and-so, you got to go work with so-and-so because they're pretty cool over there and they're doing this one thing that we don't do because we just don't. And then the word gets in, the, all of a sudden you get in the network, you know. Uh, if, you, if you need technical background, you know, like science stuff, Chemeketa programs, wonderful. Uh, the education you get at Oregon State University or even WSU. Um, where you not only learn um, the science, but you get hands-on experience is invaluable. You know, so if somebody's coming at it from that direction, for me, I, I had tons of science stuff and it all, it made sense to me, but for somebody that doesn't, I would recommend doing that. Because that's a hard one to pick up on the job. You know, if you don't know squat about chemistry, you're here to work harvest, so work harvest. I'm not teaching you chemistry, all right? You know? <laughs> so. Well, that's all the questions we have for you. Do you have anything else that you want to say or something, a question I should have asked that I didn't? I don't think so. Okay. Uh -uh. Well, thank you so much oh, for yeah. sitting down with us. Oh, no, it was great.